I mean, basically, yes, Microsoft was concerned about us. They even mentioned us in their SEC filings. In the U.S., obviously, they're used to small companies taking off. And they looked at our technology and they could see we had some really good technology. And they utilized their position to try to hold us back. I mean, I mentioned what was happening on the mobile side, which was absurd. But we had a number of different other cases where we were working with companies and uh, suddenly everything fell apart because of threats from Microsoft to their businesses. I mean, that was something that happened multiple times. Welcome to Innovational Correctness, a podcast all about innovation and transformation, hosted by David Luna, author, keynote speaker, and founder of Gamma Digital and Beyond. David and his guests discuss real-world practical advice on how to best harness the creativity of your employees and go from idea to product, giving you unique perspectives and insights into their success, all while separating hype from reality and replacing bullshit bingo with common sense. Let's jump right in into the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovational Correctness Podcast. In today's episode, I talk to industry legend John von Chechner about what it takes to compete in crowded markets where the big players such as Microsoft will resort to unethical business practices in order to win. John is the co-founder and CEO of Vivaldi Technologies, and before starting Vivaldi and its web browser, he was also the co-founder and former CEO of Opera Software. Here are some of the things that we'll cover in this interview. Why Microsoft became afraid of a small Norwegian browser startup that challenged its market dominance and resorted to unethical business practices. How Opera Mobile was able to capture almost 80% market share. What made Opera, and now Vivaldi browser, so unique and different from the other browsers on the market? The way Opera experimented with new business models, how a company can continue to add innovative features to its product without killing the usability or turning it into a Frankenstein product that nobody wants to use, how to create and foster high-performing teams, why almost all browsers can be traced back to a single origin, how Despite the seemingly endless browsers out there, there's actually very little choice and competition for end users. And finally, why browsers are some of the most complex pieces of software out there today. Without further ado, let's go meet John. So welcome to the podcast, John. Thank you. Do you want to briefly introduce yourself to the listeners and explain who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name is Jan von Tetzner. I build browsers. I've, I've been doing that as far back as 1994, first with Opera and, and uh, now with Vivaldi. Wow, that's a long time for being involved in browser development. So if we go back, say, 20 years, there were already a few browsers that were very dominant. We had Internet Explorer, of course, and Firefox was just on the rise. So how did this idea come to be to build a browser? Or why did you think there was room for another browser? Can you kind of briefly elaborate on that? Well, I mean, if, if, if we go all the way back, um, we can go back to 1992. It's 1992. We're a research group at the Norwegian telecommunication company. And we're looking at interesting technologies and we come across the, the World Wide Web. This is very early. So we set up the, the first Norwegian server, which is one of the first 100 in the world. And we start playing with various technologies. Um, we were doing kind of, we were building an intranet before the term existed. We were building uh, some search technologies. We were able to get content from different sources and display it in different ways. I actually spent a fair amount of time building um, tools to, to uh, convert documents from tools like FrameMaker to HTML, FrameMaker being a, a widely used at the time word processor in, in research uh, laboratories and the like. And then we're thinking, okay, let's build a browser. And I mean, there were big companies building browsers at the time, like IBM, Oracle, Symantec, Apple, and, and, and the like. But our thinking was, hey, we can do this. And just before building the browser, uh, we had actually built a word processor. So it's it's not like that. I mean, we we had okay, we we had the knowledge to do this, and and we decided okay, we'll build a browser, we'll build build it from scratch, uh, and we believed we could make something that would be differentiating. Oh, okay. So we really started in the early ages of the internet, so to speak. 
Yeah, very early. I mean, at this time, I mean, Microsoft wasn't there. There was uh, the big player was Mosaic. And actually, interestingly, in our research group, uh, the group was divided whether we could compete with Mosaic because Mosaic was the kind of the, the leading browser player. And, and eventually we came to the conclusion that we would, yes, we could. And we decided to build a browser as a research project. And uh, I mean, later on, you would see Microsoft entering the market and obviously Netscape. I mean, Netscape was starting probably about the same time as we were. But the difference being Netscape came, went public and disappeared before we as a small company had our first fundraising. So that begs the question, what made you guys survive or Netscape disappear and Mosaic to become the dominant player or one of the dominant players? Well, I mean, Mosaic kind of uh, got replaced by Netscape and Internet Explorer and a lot of others. Uh, the Mosaic team, some of the leading players there went on to found Netscape. And, and, and then Mosaic was licensed to companies like Microsoft. So most all browsers can be traced back to, to these browsers, right? To, to Netscape, to Mosaic, uh, and, and, and then to another one, which kind of is called KSML. So there's not really all that many browsers that have been built from scratch, but we did that and, and, and that was unique. And, and um, I mean, obviously uh, some significant competition. Now, I, I think the difference between us and Netscape is Netscape built a, a huge business and then Microsoft killed them. Well, in our case, we were still kind of small players. There was a few of us. We didn't really have any money. So we were basically just building on our own. So from that perspective, we were able to continue growing as a company through a period where kind of you would see Netscape kind of come and go in a very short period of time. So would it be correct to assume that a few companies back in the day, like yourselves, paved and pioneered the way, and then large companies from other industries like Microsoft then came in and reaped the benefits by, say, buying out uh, these smaller companies? I mean, in, in, in some ways, you can say that. I mean, clearly, I, I think the big thing that happened in the uh, rather early phases is, I mean, first there was Mosaic, and then there was Netscape, right? And then Microsoft entered the market. And I think that basically made most of the big companies and small companies give up. It was uh, very difficult to compete. Microsoft basically stopped all distribution potential. And, and, and obviously, they took away the potential to make money from the browser uh, by licensing. Um, they included it with Windows. They, they stopped you from being able to get any kind of distribution deals. And I mean, there, were, there was a massive court case later with Netscape suing and Microsoft paying a, a pretty significant amount of money to Netscape than being part of American Online. So, so uh, I mean, clearly it was a very dif difficult space to compete. And, and thus most, most everyone gave up. And why do you think... Opera and now Vivaldi is still around and others just disappeared. Why do you think that is? Well, I think, I mean, the others, I think they just looked, hey, there is Microsoft there. They include the browser with the operating system. There's no way to, to, to make money here. And they, they basically gave up. Now, in our case, we were just a, a few people and we had done things differently. I mean, most everyone else built on the same source code using the original Mosaic code. Uh, we didn't do that. We built it from scratch and our code was really good. I mean, we built a, a quality piece of code that could run on almost anything. And I think uh, particularly when it comes to uh, new markets like mobiles and the like, we, we had a unique position that we could actually take our code and we could have it run on just about anything. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and if my memory serves me correctly, then Opera Mobile had a huge market share and it was installed on every Nokia and other flip phone. And obviously we have a different ecosystem today, but maybe you can explain to the listeners who've never encountered Opera Mobile, what made it so unique and different from the other browsers? I mean, there's a number of things. And I think in a way it started with our philosophy and our philosophy was to adapt to the needs of the users. And we would adapt in uh, kind of based on the requirements of individuals, but also on the platforms they were running and the like. And I mean, we decided to make the code from scratch and uh, fairly quickly there was requirements. Okay, can you have it run on very limited hardware? And so we made it run on older computers, which was a benefit also to, to uh, again, if people had older computers, then they would be able to run Opera. Uh, and then when we started working on, on mobile phones, we actually made the code so that it actually was memory safe. 
So you could run it on phones with almost no memory and all the kinds of devices. I mean, Opera was the leading vendor on mobile in the world. Um, we were actually leading in other spaces as well. Um, televisions, game consoles. We were on game consoles like the Nintendo's DS and, and the Nintendo Wii, as an example. We, we were included with the various set-top boxes. Kind of, I mean, the, the point was at the time, typically, the, mostly the mobile browsers that were being distributed, they were very limited. They, they were made particularly for mobile. They would show mobile content like VAP, which uh, most people, I guess, luckily don't have to remember. <laughs> uh, well, we were actually providing a full browser. And, 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 and I mean, gradually, we, we, we made a, a different solution called Opera Mini, which was made to run on the smallest of the phones in particular, but was very popular also, even on smartphones. The point being that um, we dealt with the issue that some of the phones couldn't handle huge pages and also you were maybe on slow networks. So we basically ran Opera on the server side and we would then compress, send a compressed version of the pages over to the mobile phones which meant that you could browse the web on very slow network on very limited phones and you would actually have a pretty decent browse, browsing experience so this was something that made us really unique and i think i mean in certain markets we we totally dominated um we had probably like 80 percent market share in places like africa india but we also had i mean significant parts of europe uh we had very significant markets here so this is kind of the the, the mobile became very very unique but even on the PC side, we prided ourselves in, in having more functionality, prided ourselves in, in adapting to the user needs, um, whatever those might be. And, and instead of saying kind of which is typical now, which is kind of my way or the highway, I make great design, you like it. Uh, I guess our feeling is, OK, we all have different opinions on what is great design and how we'd like to have things work. And we are adaptable to those needs. And, and I think that's kind of what's, what's unique with Opera and what's been unique with Vivaldi as well. Interesting. So that would lead me to my next question then. So if the mobile operating system market was so huge and you guys had such a huge market share, why didn't Microsoft enter that market or, or did they and they were just fast asleep at, at the wheel or was it not their focus at that time? Because that would have been a huge asset nowadays if you have that many users and could then potentially upsell them with other services. Or why didn't Microsoft enter the market or, or did they and they just didn't succeed? I mean, more the latter, because, I mean, they were trying. Um, in particular, they were trying to make their own mobile operating systems. Um, and they were not really succeeding that well with them. I mean, we actually delivered Opera on quite a lot of mobile phones running the Microsoft Windows operating system. But, I mean, these phones really didn't take that much off. And, and Microsoft, I mean, they were fighting with us. It's an absurd situation because we delivered our browser, which was recognized as being great. They had a terrible browser, uh, they would still try to stop vendors from distributing our browser and distribute theirs instead. Now, most of them, they would go with us anyway, but it's an absurd situation where they would be competing with a player like us. I mean, their browser just wasn't very good. I mean, it's, it's really that simple. Uh, their browser wasn't good. And, and I guess their focus was on, on selling the operating system and their solution wasn't that great either. Yeah, I believe in, in 2004, Opera Software even settled a lawsuit with an international corporation paying over 12 million US dollars to Opera. And back then, it was actually speculated that this international corporation named in that statement announcing the, the settlement was Microsoft, which actually, you know, previously blocked these Opera users from directly or correctly viewing the MSN.com website. Can you comment at all on this on this lawsuit? And in, in particular, I would want to know if Microsoft actually felt threatened by this much smaller company called Opera and what made them sink so low and if they really felt threatened by a small company that just produced a much better product. 
I mean, I, I I can't comment on on the payout. I mean, obviously there was a payout, and I can't comment where we we got that money from. But I can comment that I mean, basically, yes, Microsoft was concerned about us. Uh, they even mentioned us in their SEC filings. I mean, I I think there's in the U.S. obviously they're used to small companies taking off, and uh, they looked at our technology and they could see we had some really good technology, and they utilized their position to try to hold us back. Uh, I mean, I mentioned what was happening on the mobile side, which was absurd. But we had uh, a number of different other cases where we were working with companies and uh, suddenly everything fell apart because of threats from Microsoft to their businesses. I mean, that was something that happened multiple times. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the world that we we were living in then and in some ways that we are living in today with, with, with Vivaldi. We are competing with big companies and, and these big companies, they have positions and, and they have power and they utilize the power, their power, whether it's unethical or kind of uh, even legal at times. That's kind of how it works. Wow, that's definitely an interesting story. And I would believe that most people would root for the underdog, on that case, Opera, against the Goliath, Microsoft. If I go back, say, 20 years when I was in, in university, I believe I first encountered Opera through a computer magazine that I picked up, and it said Opera 5, I believe it was at the time. It was like 2000, 2001, something like that. And it said the fastest browser in the world. Try it out. And I'm like, okay, that's a bold claim. And then I installed it, tried it out, and I'm like, oh, this is pretty snappy, but never replaced my main browser which was Internet Explorer, and yes, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it. But then a few years passed, and uh, I started my first job at a software and consulting company, and then never really liked Firefox for, for whatever reason, and then installed Opera. And ever since, I've used Opera and now switched a few years back to Vivaldi. So here, here's my question. So back in the days, you offered the Opera browser with an ad-sponsored version with an additional paid option. So back then we called it trialware. Why did you choose that business model where as other browser companies were going different ways, were providing their browser for free? Well, I mean, we, we went through multiple steps, to be frank. And and I mean, when we started, you, you have to remember, when we started with Opera, then actually Shareware was a concept. So we started with that. So we started with providing the browser so you could try it out for like 30 days. And then you, if you wanted to continue using it, you would pay like $30. So that's that's our initial point, and then we we had to deal with basically uh, everyone else gradually being free, uh, and that model kind of going away. But we didn't really have another working model, so we we tried basically this ad model, put in a little banner uh, in, in the browser, and um, we tried that for a little while. Actually, that works fairly well for us because now we had a free version. So people would download the free version and then they would buy. The ads never really made us any money, to be frank. But it it meant that instead of saying here where it's at free. And then we decided to, to, to go all the way and, and, and remove the ads and just be free and, and, and went for another business model. So we've gone through the motions. Now, this is on the PC side. On the, on the mobile side, we also went through the motions of different businesses business models with licensing, with service, uh, with Opera Mini, which was a client server solution that was kind of a service that we got paid monthly fees by the operators. And and, and then in a way, we went for the free model in, in the end, where we basically make uh, money from mostly through search partnerships, but also through some partnerships with like where we put in a bookmark that you might find useful. And if you use that, we get a revenue share. So we, we've gone through the different models. I mean, we had to make money one way or another, and we didn't have an operating system behind us or, or other things to pay, pay the bills. So again, we, we, we gradually changed the business models once we found new ones to work uh, that would work. And, and I really like the model where we can give everything away for free and we can still make enough money without doing anything silly or, or bad. Do you think anything on the model has changed today that maybe you're able to charge something for a browser, looking at maybe different app stores on various platforms? Do you think a paid model would work better today? I, I kind of like the the, the free model, uh, because if you did the paid model, then you would typically have a free version and then you would have a, a kind of a paid version that would cost more. 
Um, the fact is we can provide everything for free. We can do that in a way that uh, if we get enough users, then it's, it's fine. So I, I don't really see any reason to complicate things one way or another. We don't make a lot of money per user, but as long as we are making enough, uh, then it's fine. There were also other ways to monetize free software. I remember where you would install a certain piece of software and then it would come pre-selected during the installation phase with a few options. Do you want to ins install the search bar, these bookmarks or whatever, and it would be selected by default and then you would install it. And then once you would open your browser, it would be a horrendous experience. And it was almost like spyware or malware to try to get off that, that software that was pre-installed. So why didn't you choose that route? Well, I mean, it, it's a question of uh, doing, I mean, in, in, in some ways, uh, we've always been thinking about doing the right thing, right? So obviously, uh, uh, as a browser maker, uh, I mean, we, we were the first one to include search in the browser, right? That's a feature for the end user. So I think that's, that's a good thing. And, and that's what users have liked. And I think that's why every other browser has d done the, the, the same thing. They, they provided ways to uh, search easily. And that's a business model for all the different browsers. But the concept of installing other applications in, during the install or, or, or changing your systems, I mean, that's unethical. Okay, so, so you're not just looking at profit, you're looking to do the right thing and make profit, but in an ethical way. Yes, we did this at Opera. And, and I think, I mean, in, in Vivaldi, even even more, if anything, because we don't have any investors, we don't have anyone uh, pushing us in any any direction. And I would say, I mean, during my time at Opera, we, we also, we, we never did anything that we couldn't look in the mirror and say, that's okay. This, this, what we are doing here is okay. And, and I, I think that's, that's how we like to keep it. I mean, I think it's important that you have companies that have values, that focus on doing the right for the users. And, and, and that's what we did at Opera. And, and that's what we are doing at, at Vivaldi. We've been driven at, at both companies by providing software that adapts to the needs of end users. And, and, and that's kind of the goal. And I mean, at Vivaldi, we have this motto of, I mean, we are building a browser for our friends. And uh, that kind of fits with, okay, you, you, you don't want to do bad things to your friends, right? You don't spy on your friends. You, you, you don't kind of trick them. You just provide the best possible software you can. Now, I'm sure there's a few listeners out there that might think, well, you can only do this if you're not a, a public company or you're a small company, but as soon as you get large, have investors or something along the lines of that, that it's only possible if you're, if you're small and not public. What would you tell these people? Well, what I can say is that Opera, we, during my time there, we followed the straight and narrow, right? And that's even after we went public. So I think it's it's possible. I think there's a, it, it's sad that the assumption is that every company that grows big needs to become unethical. I, I don't think that's an automatic. And um, and I think, I mean, that's kind of the, the principles that we as a, as a company followed what, during my time at Opera and, and what we followed at Vivaldi, which is to do the right thing. Now, that being said, we don't have any investors in Vivaldi. And the point of that is to avoid a situation where the company can be swayed to go in a different direction. Because as soon as you get investors in, there is always the risk that you get bad investors. And at Vivaldi, given that kind of the only funding to the company comes from me, we have control. I mean, all the, all the employees are investors, but the only external funding is, is, is coming from me and by doing it that way, we can we can keep the company uh, keep the company good. Yeah, I believe that's the right approach and philosophy to take. And I always tell young startups that they should keep investors out as long as they can and try to bootstrap their startup. Because as soon as you get investors and equity in place, then you'll also have potentially interests that might not align with your vision and you'll have to have or do compromises. So in the mid 2000s, you were very successful and you even went a step further. And I believe I read an article, which I'll link in the show notes, is that on April 2005, you stated in a meeting at Opera Software that if the new version 8 at the time, reached 1 million downloads within the next four days, you would swim across the Atlantic Ocean from Norway all the way to the United States. And fortunately or unfortunately for you, 
Two days later, the downloads reached over 1 million and you had to follow through with your challenge, but then quickly failed. Can you briefly tell the listeners what made you made that bold claim and make that challenge in the first place? Initially, this was a kind of an internal thing. And then there was uh, one of the PR guys that decided to go out with it. And then I was stuck. I had to go swimming. And, and by the way, the, the PR guy, he had to go with me. It's all his fault. So he joined me in a little raft and he was going to basically ensure that we would go in the right direction. So I started swimming there in April. Quite cold in the water in Oslo. I can tell you about that, tell you that. But I mean, I started swimming and then there was a technical problem with the, uh, with the boat. Uh, there was a hole and uh, my guide couldn't swim so i had to uh, kind of ab abort the mission to save his life so it, it was really tough but uh it was really hard to then go and start again so i'm sorry about that but but um it was an it was a fun fun adventure so for the greater good you saved someone's life so to kind of switch gears you grew opera from a startup to a global company with over 900 employees at the peak in 13 countries do you want to share some of the learnings and mistakes you made along the way with the listeners? Well, I think, I mean, uh, for me, it, it was learning on the job every day. I mean, you have to remember, I mean, I'm a, I'm a geek, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and uh, I mean, the two of us that founded the company, Gail was my senior, but he didn't want to run the company. So I ended up doing it. Um, so I was learning every day and building a company with uh, really talented people. And I, I think I was really lucky starting with Gail to have really talented people with me and then as we grew we we added more talented people to the group and and i think i mean i've always believed heads think better than a head i mean the philosophy of a, a kind of I mean, again on the product side we adapt to the needs of the users on the company side we we have a structure which is flat uh, and, and 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 kind of where voices are heard and and as you grow the company the the point of focus is how do you make sure that everyone's voices is heard and how do you make sure that everyone can contribute in the best possible way and and I, I think we managed to do that and obviously we built to to the needs we got a lot of users we got a lot of deals as a company I mean Opera reached at its peak 350 million users a month active users and that's kind of what we were counting not the distribution because distribution was much higher than that and, and obviously we were doing deals with companies like Nokia and Motorola and Ericsson and, and uh, Nintendo and Sony and Samsung and LG and kind of a long list of companies that we were working with. Um, uh, and I mean, operators, Deutsche Telekom and AT&T and T-Mobile. And basically we adopted, there was always, uh, it's, it's interesting because I, I guess in the company people would say, hey, we can't handle this kind of the complexity as it grows, but, but we managed, we were doing... Um, with a fairly small team, we were doing 100 par parallel deliveries at any one time. And we were able to do that with one code base, which uh, tells you we had a really good code base and a really good team of people. So we would take the same code and we'd run it on mobile phones and, and PCs. And, and, and I mean, we would be in airplanes and gaming consoles and refrigerators and whatever else. I mean, we were able to do that because of a, a team that worked together at solving the problems and they would come up with solutions whenever they would say, OK, this is not going to scale. They would fix it. The team would come up with solutions. It wouldn't be this individual. I mean, obviously, there would always be individuals coming up with the solutions when it comes down to it. But it wasn't kind of uh, centrally managed from the perspective of kind of individuals were coming up with, okay, this is not going to scale. We need to come up with a solution. Then a few of them would work together and find solutions to make it work. And I think in a way, that's how we managed to do it. A lot of complexity and, and obviously, I mean, you can always look at, should we have done this or that differently? There's, there's always questions about that. But overall, I think what we managed to do was uh, quite a lot with a fairly small organization. And what do you think are the success factors or things that I have to have in place in order to create such high-performing teams or to create such an environment and culture? Maybe there are some CEOs out there that are listening and say, okay, I want the, the same high-performing teams like uh, John has. How do I create such an environment? Well, I think a, a lot of what we are focusing on and, and, and what we focus on is, is how do we make the team, I mean, work as well together as possible. And that, that's by lifting and letting everyone kind of reach their potential. I think if you're treating your company like a factory, which sadly a lot of people are doing, they may be saying, okay, I can outsource 
this and that. They will typically want to outsource, for example, development. That's quite typical. Well, in our case, uh, and, and I think that's something that you find out when you're doing development, there's a lot of difference be, between how effective you can be. Uh, there's a difference between how effective the programmers are, but there's also then how effective the organizational structure is. And I think in our case, we had a very effective organizational structure and people would be kind of working together closely in, 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 instead of kind of uh, just someone saying, you should do this, you should do that. Everyone is thinking about how do we do it right? And and that allows you to work much more efficiently. So you essentially have a team that is able to experiment and make mistakes, but also gets heard. Did I sum that up correctly? Yeah, I think there's, yes, uh, but I but also think, I mean, I've, I've seen so many, I've talked to so many companies where they have, okay, they have a management and the management tells, let's say, the developers what to do. And I mean, that only takes you that far. You you want everyone to be working together. And, and, and what you mentioned there of allowing mistakes, I think that's important as well. I think basically experimenting, trying out things. Obviously, sometimes you'll make mistakes then, but that's fine. I think in, in quite a lot in organizations, you take away the ability to experiment. You you make people afraid of making mistakes and then you don't try out anything. And, and then obviously you may not fail, but you fail by not doing more than what you're doing. And in our case, there's this principle of uh, heads think better than a head. And, and, and you can have people come with ideas and they, and, and they have the flexibility to come with those ideas. And, and, and I mean, we have a principle that when in doubt, make it an option, which means, okay, you can make things you think this is the right way. Well, I don't think it's the right way, but let's make it an option anyway. So those kind of decisions where there isn't a correct answer, there's just opinions. Yeah, that just reminded me of Jeff Bezos' principle of multiple paths to yes. So essentially, what, what he what he says is that if an employee comes to him and says, I have this great idea, A, B, C, and D, uh, what, what do you think? And he might not agree that that's a good idea, but then the employee can go to another senior executive and ask for sponsorship. And if one of these executives says yes, then he's able to pursue his ideas with uh, sponsorships. So there's multiple paths to yes. I think essentially it comes down to if you have a positive view of humans and, and your employees or not. Now, every employee is not going to set out and say, hey, I want to make mistakes, but humans in general will do more right than wrong. But in no case should we as leaders intervene as long as there's no great threat uh, at, at, at play. So we should allow these employees to experiment and come up with crazy ideas. Or as the old quote from Nelson Mandela goes, either we win or we learn. And I think also, I mean, another unique thing that we have uh, at Vivaldi and which we also had at Opera is, is, is the community. And we work really closely with the community. We, uh, we have volunteers that help us test, they help us translate, they give us feedback. Some of those, they get very, very early versions of our software. And the, the benefit of that is, again, we're getting continuous feedback on what we're doing. So instead of just you're, you're sitting in the corner, you're coming up with an idea, you're implementing it, and then you're launching it. Our normal way of working is we're constantly getting feedback, both internally and from, from these volunteers. And that's unique. And I, I mean, a number of these volunteers, I mean, they, they help us really, really a lot. They're, they're, some of them spent quite a lot of time helping us. And, and again, these are people uh, with with very uh, with a wealth of knowledge, which bring very useful feedback for us, and, and they help us provide much better software. So we'll test things out. I mean, typically when we are doing releases, we'll these volunteers they will be the first to test it. Then we'll send it out in, in like snapshots, uh, and then we'll get feedback from those, and then gradually we'll improve until everyone is 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 happy. And, and this is, I think it's a unique way of working. Uh, I think, uh, again, the big companies, they'll, the way they'll get feedback is, is collecting usage uh, statistics. Um, so they're monitoring what their users are doing, which personally I'm not a fan of collecting that kind of information. Uh, I would rather just get it from the users uh, and they tell us what they want instead of monitoring. Again, it's a, it's, it's a different way of, of working with your user base. And I think what we're doing there is, 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 is the right way and, and, and it's the way that we prefer to do things. 
Yeah, it's it's funny that you just mentioned being very user centric or close to the user or customer. I remember when when Google first started and they were becoming a large search engine. That one of the big proponents, Marissa Mayer, she was the former uh, CEO of Yahoo. That uh, when when she left Google, that she would be very very. KPI driven. So anything that would be potentially changed on the start page uh, of Google would have to be backed up by by KPIs and statistics before anything would would actually be changed. Yeah, and I see unfortunately too many companies that have a multi stage supply chain. So basically, if you're say producing uh, a certain good and have multiple uh, subsidiaries, and those subsidiaries again have multiple vendors and retailers and things like that, that will ultimately lead a lot of these companies to be out of touch with the actual end user of your product. So oftentimes these companies will not really know how those products are actually used and, and why they're used in, in a certain way. So they essentially lose touch of the actual jobs to be done. And that's so critical nowadays uh, because you miss a lot of these opportunities. And the fact that you were using this philosophy, for lack of a better word, very early on just speaks volumes to how good your company was managed. And the other issue is, you know, a lot of companies use vanity metrics. You know, the the king among them is revenue. You can make three billion dollars in in revenue, but that means nothing because it doesn't tell you if you made a loss or not. But there's also, I mean, when you're looking at these statistics, you, you end up with kind of a lowest common denominator. Kind of, you 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 try to optimize for a group of people that doesn't exist because you're looking at statistics. But we're talking about individuals, and individuals have different opinions. So there isn't one correct way to do software. There is a correct way for me, there's a correct way for you, or there's a correct way for any any person. And that's kind of what we've been finding, is that people have different opinions on how their software should look, how it should function. Some people prefer to use uh, keyboard shortcuts. Other people like to use mouse gestures. Some people like to have their tabs on the left or right side instead of at the top, or they like to hide the tab bar. So there's all these different opinions on, on how things should be done and we do not believe that it's our decision on how all of this should work this it's, it's uh, we provide the flexibility to the users and again some of those users that we're working with those volunteers they they have uh, a lot of demands uh, a lot of details that like exactly their way and we'll do whatever we can to provide the flexibility in the application so they can get it exactly how they want it to work. And again, with something like a browser, you're spending so much time with your browser. Many of us are doing hours a day in front of the browser. So having a tool that can kind of grow with your needs is, is, is kind of a natural. Yeah, absolutely. So if we fast forward to the year 2011, all was going well and then you suddenly left Opera Software. Can you elaborate why that was and why you left Opera? Yeah, I think in, in a way, I mean, you mentioned, and, and again, there's a reason why we don't have any investors in Vivaldi. When we went public, I mean, we had some investors in the company. Uh, we, we got some VCs in. We got them quite late in the company's history, but around 2000, we got a couple of VCs in. And when we went public in 2004, Kind of, and, and that was kind of the promise that I made to the investors. So we provided with an exit, which was to go public. And one of the VCs sold their shares like the VCs are supposed to do. The other one, the owners of the fund had different opinions and some of them wanted to stay inside the company. And suddenly we had investors that were in the company that had a different opinion on how the company should be run. They wanted to sell the company. And that was what we were dealing with. So for very many years, I mean, for a period of six years, we had a continuous fight with a subset of the investors because they wanted us to sell the company. And I think at some stage, and this is 2010, it, this was getting tiring. And I guess my thinking was, if I step aside, maybe the company will not have to uh, do fights on, on two places at the same time, both with the investors and, and, and competition. So again, the company was in really good shape. We were profitable. We had plenty of money in the bank, but I decided that I would stop the fight and, and, and step aside. I guess from that time, they were trying to sell the company. 
And I mean, it took them six years to do so, but that's kind of kind of what happened there. And I mean, it again, it shows the difficulty when you have investors. Are you wanting to go in the same direction? And and in this case, we had active investors that wanted to go in a different direction, and and and, and there was a, a lot of fighting a, a, around that. It was very tiring, and at uh, some states, uh, I guess um, I had to give up on that fight. But that's. Again, the reason why there's no investors in Vivaldi, because I never want to build another company to have it torn down by rogue investors. That's very understandable. So why why did uh, you go public in the first place? Well, the thing is, we got investors in to allow us to grow. And the point was, when you have these VCs, you have to provide an exit. They they do not sit in the companies. They they want to sell their shares. So you had two options. Either we sell the company or we go public. And we went public. And obviously, as a public company, you still have to deal with uh, the potential of uh, companies wanting to buy us. But there was, uh, and I think a number of the investors, they looked at our position and they were thinking, okay, you're competing with big guys. You're doing good so far. I'm sure you're going to fail. So let's try to sell the company while we can from the perspective of, of maximizing maximizing shareholder value. Um, my view was always uh, we should just continue to build the company. And, and obviously, if, if an offer comes in, we have to deal with it. And, and I mean, that's the decision of investors. And obviously, I was a big investor in the company as well. They believed that they could, they could get more out of selling the company. I, I think they were wrong. And and I, I think I mean they didn't really do a very good job of of selling. I mean they ended up selling the company at a reasonably low price. But that's kind of the the, the problem when you have people with different opinions on, on where you want to bring the company. So according to my research, you also criticized that opera management back then was too quarterly focused. So essentially focusing too much on the financial results every quarter instead of focusing on the bigger picture, which could enable opera to grow into new areas and expand its its product base. And I also remember a story back in, I believe it was 2001, where Porsche refused to give the standard it was listed in, I think it was the MDAX back then, to give the investors quarterly reports. So essentially what, what the German stock exchange did, they threw them out of the, the index. And their their argument was was basically that Porsche said with these quarterly reports we're losing focus of our vision to build great cars and that actually promotes this up and down of the stocks. So that was very unique for a German public noted company to openly criticize this quarterly focused business and to actually follow through with it. Yeah, I mean, in our case, I mean, we were giving uh, shareholders quarterly reports. And in some ways, that doesn't need to be the, the, the issue. Uh, I, again, I did that for six years as, as, as a CEO of the company. And obviously, we had great results uh, generally. But I mean, we still had to deal with the quarterly pressure. But I think it's a question of what you do in this situation and, and, and kind of if you're thinking about the long term. And I think the big change after I left Opera was that I think they were looking to sell the company, so they were optimizing, kind of making the numbers look better. So every quarter, there would be an extraordinary event that would make the numbers look better, typically firing some people, because that kind of would like the, make the numbers look better in the short term, uh, or, or some other operation. And I think, I mean, in, in my case, it, I was always just focusing on building. So the company went in a very different direction uh, where they actually ended up firing a, a lot of really talented people. And then at the same time, taking some of those funds and investing them in buying other companies, which uh, I think were really bad investments. I think it's, 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 it's crazy that they wouldn't uh, continue to invest in the browser company and and, and, and make the most of it. I mean, one of the decisions that they made was to throw away all the source code that we had built. What made us unique at Opera? I mean, I think that was a massive mistake uh, to throw away all that source code. It was a very good piece of source, but they didn't see the value in it. They were saying, okay, we can just build on top of the work of others and, and save money that way. And But that takes away the uniqueness of, of, of the company. And, and, and I think, so. I mean, it's, it's, it's examples of really bad short-term decisions because they were just trying to make the multiples look better because they were expecting to sell really quickly. 
Yeah, you unfortunately see that too often in the startup realm where startups will try to sell their idea as fast as possible. So you'll have a a few people that uh, have a great idea, then they'll try to build traction and then sell it as fast as they can, just make a, a quick buck, so to speak. But your story kind of reminded me, even though it was a different setting and it was your choice to make to leave Opera, uh, was when Steve Jobs got ousted from his own company. So if I would be in your position and I would have built the company, the team and made a great product, that would have been really heart wrenching for me to say, OK, this th- enough is enough. Uh, I'm going to leave Opera. So that must have been really hard for you to actually leave Opera behind. Yeah, I mean, that was it was a really hard decision to leave Opera. And, and actually, I mean, uh, it, it it was, I mean, seeing then what was happening at the company with people being fired and the like. But the reality, the, the decision to then make Vivaldi came actually quite a lot later. Uh, because initially, my thinking was, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll obviously, I'll never compete with my old company. I mean, I know all the guys that are working there. There's a really a lot of fantastic people. I'll never be able to compete with that anyway, but I wouldn't want to, right? So that's kind of my initial thinking. But then Opera decided to throw away all the source code. They decided to kind of change the company culture and, and, and again, fire a lot of people and change the design philosophy and, and all that. And that kind of forced my hand, which is why we made Vivaldi. But I mean, the decision to make Vivaldi came two years after I left Opera. And, 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 and again, I mean, it, it, was, um, it was a difficult decision to do that. But in, in some ways, uh, with what was happening at Opera, it, it was an easy decision. Yeah, it's, it's always really tough to leave a company, especially if you built the company from scratch and just to, to let it go. But let's talk about the time after Opera. After you left Opera, you started Vivaldi. What has changed? Has the philosophy remained the same? What are some differences between Opera and now Vivaldi? And Vivaldi is still a free browser. So what are some things that that have changed? Well, I think in a, in a way, when Opera decided to stop being Opera, uh, meaning that they changed the philosophy of, of uh, the software, uh, and the organization, we felt, okay, then we need to build another one. And, and that's kind of, we decided to build Vivaldi. And so in some ways, Vivaldi is a, is a natural replacement for what Opera used to be, uh, which is a browser that uh, kind of focuses on the needs of, of, of the users and, and, and thinks about the individual instead of just uh, the group. So that's a unique thing that we do. And I mean, the big difference compared to last time is that we don't have any investors. Obviously, that's because when I left Opera, I had a fair amount of shares at Opera that I ended up selling, which then has allowed me to to, to fund the growth of Vivaldi instead. So we don't need external investors. Uh, Obviously, uh, the goal is to be profitable, and and, and I believe we will be. Uh, But uh, the initial uh, investment and and the steps is, 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 is done by me. So I believe in in 2016, Opera was then sold to Chinese investors. And at that time, you already started Vivaldi. And then also in in January 2020, short seller Hindenburg Research, basically a a forensic financial research organization, claimed that Opera offered predatory short-term loan products in Kenya, India, and uh, Nigeria. And according to the report, at least, most of Opera's lending business was operated through Google's Play Store. When, when you heard of that, what did you think when, when that came out? Were you shocked? Were you disappointed? What were your initial reactions? I mean, I, I obviously, I didn't really know where Opera would go with the new ownership. And obviously, I mean, I'm very disappointed to to see the the name of Opera. Uh, it kind of in, it, at the same time that you're talking about predatory lending. So I, I don't know the details of these stories and and they're like, but it doesn't sound good. And obviously, it's terrible to 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 hear hear stories like that. Yeah, and that was also the point where I personally said to myself, I have to get rid of Opera, even though up till then I, I loved Opera very much because. I had it on my machine nonstop for 15 years, but as soon as the Chinese investors took over and that story came out, I had to look for a replacement. And then luckily I found Vivaldi and Vivaldi has been uh, really great. I mean, you can customize the, the living shit out of it, literally. 
And one thing that, that struck me while I was doing research for this episode was how many browsers are actually based on Chromium or the Chromium rendering engine. So even though one would think there's a lot of choice in browsers, you have the Brave, you have Edge, you have Firefox, you have Chrome, you have Vivaldi, Opera, and, and so on. They're almost all, except Firefox, based on Chromium. So I have a few geeky questions. Why do you think there's so little choice and thus competition when it comes to rendering engines? Is it that complicated? Speaking as someone that has no programming uh, experience, so complicated to develop a, a rendering engine? It, it's really hard to make. I mean, it, 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 it's a really complicated piece of software. I mean, at Opera, and I think this is kind of the decision why the, the Opera team decided to, to kill off Presto, which was our engine. We had 100 people working on it, right? Uh, 100 really talented people. And actually, we, we needed to add more people uh, to the team. And I think they decided, okay, we can save money by, by not having 100 people working on this. Uh, and again, 100 really, really, really talented people that had been doing this for years and, and knew exactly what to do. So uh, again, I think it was a massive mistake for them to, to kill the browser team there. But I think if you look at the history of browsers, I mean, there's talk of like Google Chrome. Now, where did Google Chrome come from? Well, Google Chrome came from WebKit, which was by Apple. But where did that one come from? That came from KHML, which was a Linux project. The reality is uh, even the big guys, even companies like Microsoft and Apple and Google didn't think that they could compete and had to get code from somewhere else. And I think that tells you something. And that's kind of why there wasn't an option for us. I mean, we had 100 people working on this at Opera. So if we wanted to build this from scratch, that's the amount of people we would need to maintain it. And then first we would have to build it. So you build something, you make sure that it's compatible with everything out there. It, it, the complexity is just huge. So, so from that perspective, that wasn't an option for us, just like it wasn't an option for Google or Apple or Microsoft. So is that legend true that browsers are some of the most complex computer programs out there? Well, I mean, the, the browser is like an operating system in many ways. I mean, it runs the applications. So it views pages, but it also runs full-blown applications. And, and, and obviously, you, there's a lot of complexity in there. You have to deal with a lot of different content that is uh, following standards, but quite often not accurately. So you have to deal with being compatible with uh, other browsers' uh, interpretation of the standards, which is uh, almost impossible. It, it, yes, it is a really complex piece of software to do. I mean, obviously you can today decide to, to build something on top of something like Chromium, but even that is complicated because you have to deal with the fact that you're building a house on a moving platform, right? This is, uh, this is not trivial. If it was trivial, I can tell you that Google, Microsoft, Apple, and others would have basically built their own, and they haven't. All of them have built they have taken code from others and built on top of that. I mean, the fact that Microsoft and Opera have given up on their code, I mean, I think in Opera's case, it was just a stupid mistake. But the fact that even Microsoft has given up on their own core and is using Chromium, I, I think it tells you a story. This is not trivial to do. Wow, I, I learned something new. I didn't know that so many browser engines came from almost one single source from, from Linux. It's this, and it's kind of a funny story in a way because uh, this KHML project, and again, this is kind of what happens. No one knows where this code came from. That code was being programmed on in the same building as Opera in Norway, and some of the developers actually had access to the Opera code. <laughs> so there's a, a bit of a history there. So again, I mean, they built a, a, a fairly limited browser, uh, the KHML browser, which was being used uh, as part of the KDE Linux project. And uh, that project was then contacted by Apple. They decided to take that and build WebKit, which they then tried to get everyone else to use. And they managed to get, for example, Nokia and, 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 and Google to, to make use of that. That's kind of how this code that started off as a Linux project became the norm. I already see a, a plot twist coming, something along the lines of a news headline stating, Norwegian browser company demands billion dollars of royalties from Apple, Google, and Microsoft for using their browser software for decades. I, I don't see that happening. <laughs> uh, it would be a fun story, though. 
It's a fun story, but uh, but it is really interesting that uh, when it comes to uh, the code bases, I mean, there are not many browser code bases around, and the two of them came from the same building in Oslo. If we turn around the question, what would you want to see if you had basically unlimited money or you would have enough money to develop a browser from scratch, rendering engine, everything, what would you change? I mean, how would it look like? Well, I think in a way, what I liked about the fact that when we were doing uh, Presto, when we were doing the Opera code base, is that we had a code base that was all ours, right? When we're working now with Chromium, that code base, there's code from multiple projects. I mean, it, you can sense how it's kind of grown from one place to another. And it, it means it's complicated. It, it's, it's this really complicated beast of code. While what we were building at Opera was kind of, we did everything. We were not invented here. We would take, I mean, everyone else was using the same code for the most part for things like basic images and the like, and we would build our own instead. And I, I think that was rather unique. I mean, we, we made code that was then more efficient and, and, and obviously more coherent. I think that's kind of when you have these code bases that kind of where there's a lot of different people sitting in different places with different interests that combine into one code base. The question is, is, is does it work well together? And, and I, I mean, there's a lot of complexity with this code. There's a lot of history. And, and, and I think that's you, you get the baggage. So a cleaner code base would be nicer. But I think realistically, that's not going to be easy to do and, and definitely not for us. I mean, we don't have unlimited means. So instead, we'll take that code base that we have there and we'll build something great on top of it. Yeah, that's the most pragmatic approach we one could take with, with limited means. Yeah. One, one pressing question I still have is, how do you continue to add very innovative features to Vivaldi that I haven't seen elsewhere um, without killing the usability or turning it into a Frankenstein product that nobody wants to use or it's just unusable? I mean, I think that's a, a challenge that a lot of companies have. How do you contend with that? What we do is we build a lot of flexibility. So that means you, you can make it work the way that you like, right? So yes, we are adding an awful lot of uh, f features and we'll continue to add an awful lot of features, but you'll always have the possibility to hide or, or even remove those features and you'll be able to customize things to your liking. And gradually we'll be having more and more of these ready-made concepts. So you can actually have a really simple browser or a really, really advanced browser. Uh, it, it's based on the same code base, uh, but we are just building an awful lot of flexibility into what we are doing. That's kind of how we do it. And, and, and yes, you have all that functionality, but if you're not using it, it shouldn't be in your face. It shouldn't be in your way. And that's kind of our focus. And I think you'll find in the company, you'll have people that like simplicity. You'll find people that like complexity. And, and we do whatever we can to keep both or all the different groups, because in practice, it's a lot of different groups. People will say something, I want it simple. And then you ask them, okay, what is simple? And then they'll say, oh, I want this feature and this feature and this feature. And but those are special features that only some people want. So you, you basically end up with very many different kinds of products. And that's, we just end up with a lot of flexibility and, and then gradually trying to make sure that people, people can get what they want easily. So essentially hiding the complexity from the user, keeping it simple, but the user can then add complexity or functionality if he so chooses. Well, it's all there. And, and, and I mean, what we are defining as a browser is, is quite different. I mean, we're building in now a mail client, a calendar. We have notes functionality. We have all this kind of functionality that you may or may not use. If you use it, it's there. If not, it shouldn't bother you. It shouldn't be visible. And that's kind of what we are working on. One of the last questions I have is, what are you most excited about when it comes to browsers for the next few years? Maybe you can give us a, a sneak peek of what's to come or what you're most excited about. Well, I mean, uh, for us, we've been working such a long time on, on kind of getting the, the rich functionality in. I mean, I, I mentioned mail and calendar and the like. I mean, for a lot of us, we spend a lot of time in the browser. So what we want to is to make sure that the browser can satisfy all the needs that you have from your browser and, and it also help keep you safe. And there's a number of different things that come in there. There's things like tracker blocking and ad blocking. And I think in a way the browser plays a, a, an important role there. I really think that government should play an important role there because I think we need regulation on the collection of data, which is happening far too frequently on the internet and the buildings of profiles and the like. 
like, which I think should just be banned, to be frank. The building of profiles on your users, basically spyware. I mean, uh, that's that's not what you should be finding in software. So hopefully what we'll be seeing is, is, is government taking a step there. But from the browser side for us, I mean, we're trying to build a tool that can adapt to whatever need you have, help you work in a way which is not so centralized, right? Not so dependent on being locked into the big guys. We are working on providing you with ways where you can have a distance between you and the big guys that you don't have to log into them all the time. And, and that's a core for us, that providing you with uh, providing with more privacy, providing you with more security, providing you with freedom to choose. Okay, that, that definitely sounds very exciting. And there's also a few aspects I didn't really see before is if you have your Google Calendar open in a tab, then you can be tracked. But if you have it in and directly integrated into the uh, to the browser, then you're not trackable in, in a sense. It's making it harder. Point is, uh, what we're trying to work on is that, that you don't have to be, I mean, obviously, preferably, if you're just not using the Google services, right? So you can have your calendar either locally, or you can work with a third party, which is not one of the big guys that collects data from multiple sources. And, and and by doing that, then you're you're staying more safe. And I think I, I know across the world, in in Germany and other places, people are really focused on on the privacy side and not just using the big guys. And providing alternatives there is so important. I mean, we are seeing the consequences of this data collection. And I think, I mean, over the years, there's been things that I fought for and we fought for in the browser space, open standards and the like has been really important uh, over the years. I think now it's keeping the internet open and free and, 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 and ensuring that it's uh, this collection of data is stopped and uh, we can do certain things to help people get away from the data collection. And then I hope that the governments will do their part. Obviously, I want to be very respectful of your time and I appreciate you coming on the, on the podcast. Um, before we leave, is, is there something that I didn't mention or didn't for, forgot to touch on that I should have mentioned? Good question. I mean, we, we covered a lot of a lot of ground. I really think, again, as I said, we are at the, in some ways as a crossroads. I think it's for me following the internet from the very beginning. I always felt that we were kind of the task for us as a browser company was to help people get online. So the equal access to information and data was crucial. Uh, and again, now we are seeing a different world where people are misusing data and the like. And, and I would like us to, to fight for ensuring that we change that and, and, and that people's privacy and, the, and this use of data is controlled. So I think that's, that's really important for us as a company, continuing to focus on the needs of the users. I, I think that's core, that everyone should get the browser that they want. And that's going to continue to be our focus as a company. I'm I'm really proud of the the team that we have and 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 of all those people that are willing to spend so much time helping us spread the word and help us test and and, and the like. I, I feel like it's a unique unique place to be. I, I hope that we can contribute to making the internet. Um, get back on the straight and narrow. Definitely support that message. Uh, so if people want to get into touch with you, what, what's the best way of doing so? So that's a good question. I mean, probably just going to our website and, and, and going into the forums and the like, that's always a good place to, to get to people. I guess people can also send me messages on, on, on like Twitter and uh, and the like. I'm not sure if I want to give my email address in the podcast, but it, it's fairly easy to get hold of me. Okay, I'll be sure to include the uh, Twitter handle and the Opera forums. So if anyone gets to in touch with, with Opera. Uh, Vivaldi, Vivaldi forums. I don't hang out in the Opera forums anymore. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Vivaldi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm so so attached to the to the to the opera name still, and uh, yeah, so I'll include that. And uh, yeah, thanks for for being on the podcast and, and taking the time. Thank you. Well, that wraps up another fascinating interview. I don't know about you, but there were quite a few things that I learned from this episode. For example, I wasn't really aware that almost all browsers can be traced back to almost a single origin. And it was also really eye-opening to me to hear how complex and how much effort it is to create a rendering engine, let alone maintain such a code base. Now, that makes me appreciate that that single piece of software that I use most in my daily business and life 
is managed by a huge amount of people. Now, this episode has also shown the sad truth that despite being the innovative and even most innovative player on the market, that doesn't really guarantee you'll win. Oftentimes, incumbents with a huge market position or market share will try to do anything to defend their existing position and business model, even if that means they'll have to resort to illegal practices, as as we've seen with Microsoft and the like. But on the bright side, it also shows us that companies can compete in crowded markets against industry giants by providing a work environment that really values the opinions of every employee and encouraging them to experiment and to take risks to push the boundaries uh, of your respective industry. Opera was, and Vivaldi still are, sadly the only browsers out there that really are trying to create new and innovative concepts on ways we browse the web. For example, Apple just introduced a speed tile type feature in Safari on their newest OS update, Big Sur, which Opera had since at least 2007. But I mean, to be fair, Apple's goal was never to be first. So welcome to the party, Apple, even if you're more than a decade late. At least, you know, Safari has copy and paste functionality. And finally, the more pressing issue is the constant and pervasive web tracking of our browsing habits, which big corporations collect in order to sell us more things we don't need to basically impress people we don't like with money some people don't even have. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's plenty more where that came from. Just head to our podcast website, innovationalcorrectness.com or gammabeyond.com, or just follow us on LinkedIn. There you will also find long-form articles, videos, and other podcast episodes about innovation and transformation. And if I could ask you for one small favor, it would be this. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Overcast, or the podcast app of your choice. It really helps us out by encouraging more people to find our podcast and reach hard-to-get guests. Last but not least, if you have any suggestions, for further episodes or guests that we should invite on our podcast or just have feedback you have three options emailing us at info at gammabeyond.com filling out our anonymous feedback form at innovationalcorrectness.com or leaving us a voice message with your question or feedback so that it can be included in the podcast and all listeners can profit just go to innovationalcorrectness.com links are in the show notes 